Thank you, Madam Speaker. My family has called Fort McMurray home for over 50 years. My dad's family moved to Fort McMurray in the 1970s to make a better life for themselves. And shortly after moving to Fort McMurray, my grandfather got a job at a place called Syncrude, working to build the extraction plant in anticipation of first oil. My dad, Gord, proudly worked at Syncrude, securing Canada's energy future for 42 years. He started in 1978, right after graduation and right before first oil. And he stayed until his retirement. He had three careers within the time. First as a machinist, then as a process operator, and finally he found his passion in operations integrity and safety. I eventually followed in my dad's footsteps. Through university, I took summer jobs at Syncrude, learning about extraction, maintenance, health and safety, governance, oil sands, and so much more. And after university, I started working at North American Construction Group in Mining Division. Um, within the Health and Safety Department. It was such a wonderful experience and I was able to work on so many different job sites throughout the region wearing steel toe boots with dirty fingernails and I absolutely loved my time. I had a first-hand opportunity to see how seriously this industry took health and safety, environmental responsibilities and the role they played in not only Fort McMurray's economy, Alberta's economy, but the Canadian economy. I had the opportunity to meet with thousands of people, hardworking, wonderful people from all across Canada and the world that decided to come to my hometown and make it their hometown to work in the oil sands and make a better life for their families. My community and the industry that drives it has been a beacon of hope for so many people for so long. In the 80s and 90s, thousands of Atlantic Canadians flocked to Fort McMurray after the coal mines were shut down in Cape Breton and after the fisheries collapsed. Thousands of people came. They became my friends, my family, my neighbours. They are some of the most amazing people. But they came to Fort McMurray not by choice, but because some government thought they knew best. Now, after eight years of this Liberal NDP government, my community is struggling. Eco-radicals now sit around a cabinet table and advocate against Canada's world-class energy industry at every turn. They've made no attempt to even hide their distaste for oil and gas. The Prime Minister has stated on now three separate occasions that there is no business case for Canadian LNG. That is shameful, Madam Speaker. The anti-energy agenda from this government has been consistent and punishing over the last eight years. Anti-energy messaging, delays, and arbitrary and inconsistent regulatory conditions, and frankly, an outright veto of approved pro export pipelines. They've pushed forward with anti-energy legislation at every turn, including our No More Pipelines Bill C-69, that despite universal provincial opposition, they decided, no, they were going to go ahead with it. Despite the fact that they didn't have jurisdiction, they decided, nope, they were going to go ahead with it. And frankly, the part that really hurts with that bill, particularly, is that they knew that if you couldn't move the oil and it got landlocked, it couldn't be produced. So that was their sneaky way of shutting down oil without shutting down oil. Canada should and could be the world's energy producer and supplier of choice and be the place where energy security and self-sufficiency. Canada could be completely energy self-sufficient if government could get out of the way. But time and time again, the Liberals continue to put ideology and partisanship above supporting our economy or even reality. They fail to understand that these are people, these are hardworking people, these are our neighbours, our friends, and they work hard every single day. 
politicians in this chamber do not mince their words when it comes to speaking in disdain of this industry. In fact, the member for Timmins James Bay even went so far as to table legislation to make it illegal to say anything supportive of the oil and gas industry. Anything, including true verifiable facts, punishable by massive fines and up to and including jail time. So in fact, under if his bill were to pass, what we would have was saying something that is true and verifiable, such as natural gas is cleaner burning than coal, would be illegal. This is insane. Yet the Liberal NDP coalition continue pushing their agenda and continue pushing forward with this bill. I haven't heard any members from the Liberal or NDP denounce this insane bill because they probably support it. And that's why we are so fearful of everything that this government does when it comes to energy. I wish politicians could simply be honest about the outcomes of their policies. Not wordsmithing, not negotiating, not transitioning and calling it somehow just. We need to accept in this chamber and across the country that Canadian oil and gas, gas jobs are sustainable jobs. The Liberal Just Transition is a dangerous government-mandated plan to kill 170,000 Canadian jobs and risk the livelihood of 2.7 million Canadians. 2.7 million Canadians. This bill is a step. No, it's actually not a step. It's more like a leap towards government central planning. Soviet-style government central planning. That is exactly what this is going towards. They claim this government, the NDP Liberal government, claim to value Canadian oil and gas, and yet they want to increase exports. But after eight years, they've interfered to kill four pipelines, two of which were specifically designed to export off the west and east coasts. But don't worry, Madam Speaker. Hope is on the horizon. Conservatives are going to do everything we can to push back against this legislation. But do you know what the real solution is? It's electing the leader of the official opposition and the member from Carleton as our next Prime Minister. Conservatives will make traditional energy and the development of fuels of the future more affordable and accessible to Canadians. Conservatives will fix what the Liberals broke and keep Westerners and all provinces in control of their natural resources. We will respect provincial jurisdiction. Nous allons respecter la juridiction des provinces quand ça fait aux ressources naturelles et dans tous les autres cas. C'est absolument nécessaire qu'on reste. Alors, il faut s'assurer que il faut respecter la we have to respect province jurisdictions when it comes to natural resources. Up and costs and timelines down to ensure Canadian energy security and self-sufficiency and increase exports to the world. We need technology, not taxes, Madam Speaker. We need to support an industry that supports this country. And as I described earlier, to so many Canadians, Fort McMurray was at one point in time a beacon of hope of prosperity and a fresh start. To the world's leading oil producers, we're a tough competitor who refuses to lie down. But for far too many elected officials across this country, we're simply a cash cow that they can abuse. To the fringe eco-activists, we're unfortunately the enemy. But to me, Fort McMurray has and always will be home. I was born and raised here and Conservatives of every stripe, federal, provincial and municipal, have always had our back. They understand that when Fort McMurray works, Alberta works, and when Alberta works, Canada works. I will not back down from all of the politicians in this chamber who seek to landlock and firewall our oil sands. Pipelines and energy corridors are items of critical national importance and interest for the long-term viability, not only of northeastern Alberta, but Canada and the world. And Madam Speaker, I urge every member of this chamber to vote against this disastrous bill. 
questions and comments, uh, the Honourable Member for Labrador. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And of course, Bill C-50 is a bill that is really opening up the potential of Canada's clean energy agenda. And those who can't see that, Madam Speaker, is stifling progress in this country. And that's what I heard from the speech from the Honourable Member. Maybe she'll agree with the President of the Alberta Federation of Labour or the President of the Business Council of Alberta, who says that in order to shape our future and create jobs by providing the resources that the world needs, we need to have the Sustainable Jobs Act. People in her province are supporting this act. Many of the companies are already transitioning. They're giving their workers the skills that they need. And I asked the member... To Double member on a, point, on a point of order from the Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. Madam Speaker, I know the Business Council of Alberta, and I've questioned them on that very stat that she and her colleagues have actually brought forth this, this floor. And they have you are questioning a quote that was made. The honourable member is, is questioning a quote. I have no possibility of, of determining if it's a, a true quote or not. So, um, yes, the honourable member for uh, Kingston and the Islands. Order, Madam Speaker. The Conservative member who just interrupted there did it, and he knew full well that this was a debate. Now, he's interrupted the question. I would encourage you to dial the clock back and allow the member to ask her question from the beginning again, please. Well, I will not restart the question, but I will allow the honourable member to, uh, to finish the question. Madam Chair, just for the record, I'd like to quote the President of the Business Council of Alberta and ask the member from Fort McMurray if she supports the, the work that they are doing when they say the Sustainable Jobs Act represents an important opportunity for Canada to shape our future and create jobs by providing the resources that the world needs. Everyone in this world sees that there is an opportunity with the clean energy agenda, except the Conservatives, and they offer no alternatives, as the member has just indicated. Honourable Member for Fort McMurray, Cold Lake. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Actually, Alberta is the leader when it comes to clean energy um, in the country. And, and earlier in her question, before she was interrupted, um, she actually was asking and quoting the AFL president, who is ironically now running for Alberta's NDP, a party that has been very clear about their distaste and dislike of uh, Alberta's oil sands and oil and gas industry. In fact, the Alberta NDP, when they were in government, created an oil sands task force where they appointed Sapora Berman, who called my hometown Mordor. So frankly, I'm not going to take a single piece of advice when it comes to supporting what the AFL is saying from that side of the House. Thank you. Questions and comments? Questions and comments? No questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Abitibi, Beijing's Nunavut EU. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have an um, easy question for my colleague. She talked about clean energy in Alberta. I'm not sure what she means exactly because it doesn't seem like that when you can see that there's oil running in Alberta. So really, I wonder if the Conservatives were in power, I don't think that the production of uh, fossil fuels would necessarily drop. So I would like to ask that to my colleague. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I will answer in French. Alberta is a leader of clean energy here in Canada, and we will continue to be leaders if uh, we are uh, allowed to, and if the federal government stops interfering in our provincial affairs, and we will ensure that natural resources are developed in a way that is sensitive to the environment. We will do that. But if the federal government continues to interfere in provincial jurisdiction, we're going to continue to have problems. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and my honourable colleague for Fort McMurray Cold Lake. The only thing that could possibly make a climate activist think this bill was worth more than the paper it was written on is the overreaction from the Conservative benches. So I would suggest to my Conservative friends that if they would just look at this bill and honestly say, gee, I think this is a nothing burger, then that would also help 
our side that wants to see real climate action say, aha, nothing, Berger. Why don't we go back to the report of the task force on coal sector workers, bring in really meaningful measures, such as when a coal sector worker or a fossil fuel worker is going to lose a job, let's make sure they're supported so they don't have a problem paying the mortgage on their house, make sure they get their pension earlier. All the principles that were adopted in the earlier work that took place in 2018. Member for uh, Fort Macquarie Cold Lake. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, but that's part of the problem. Government should not be deciding which jobs should and should not exist. This should be left to a space where the economy and industry gets to work to collaboratively to do this. But this is part of the problem. When the Green Party is trying to say, just trust us, this is a nothing burger, that raises huge red flags to me because. We have heard very clearly that this is a problem. And you know what's one of the big problems with this bill, on top of every other big problem in this bill, is the fact that we haven't heard from a single witness at committee. Because they said, oh, well, we've already studied this, possibly, so no, we're not going to bring in any witnesses. So we don't even know what the eco-activists think. We don't know what the, what the industry thinks because they haven't actually had an opportunity to come before committee and have this. And that becomes a serious problem because as this government has done time and time again, they have shirked their responsibility and stepped on provincial jurisdiction, which means that when and if this gets challenged into the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court justices will not have expert witness testimony to go off of to, to figure out what was the intent of the government, further costing taxpayers valuable money and doing nothing. 